Good Friday, everybody. It's nice to imagine seeing you up at our wine bar again, and hopefully we will see you soon. Still hoping for that day, at any rate. Thank you for watching these videos. We appreciate your connecting with us this way. And uh, as you know, every Friday we're putting a new one out just to keep things, uh, keep ourselves attractive to you, I guess. So here we are, yet another Friday, just another day at the Wine Steward. It's not quite just another day for Pleasanton, however. Uh, many of you already know what will be happening here in Pleasanton, California, our cute little city town, and uh, others may not know. At any rate, I would like to start our day, our little video, with a comment on wine appreciation, which seems to be off topic. I mean, it's on our topic, but it's not on the topic that I was going to address. But I was gonna say something about how many of us are, on certain days, at certain times, wine drinkers. At other times, we are actual wine lovers. Some people are just wine drinkers, that's cool. We'll sell them any bottle they want. Mm -hmm. But we who are, at certain times, certain evenings, certain days of the week, in certain venues, actual wine lovers, that means we're starting to appreciate. We can, in fact, come to a wine that we don't normally drink. Maybe you're not a Zinfandel drinker. Your friend is having a Zinfandel. Your friend is a, a, a collector of great Zinfandel. And okay, well, he likes Zin. I'm gonna have Zin with him today. Point is, you can be a wine drinker along with him and just swallow it and get it over with. Or you can, in fact, come at it with wine love. In other words, wine appreciation. You can smell the wine. You can all of a sudden realize this thing has something to say that perhaps you didn't anticipate. It's been a long time since your last Zinfandel. All of a sudden you're appreciating. All of a sudden you have the ability as a wine appreciator to say, this is not my cup of tea, but it's a damn good cup of tea. In other words, it's respect and it's uh, just a open-mindedness that you don't always have to have because like I said, you're often just wine drinking, not always a wine appreciating. You don't always have to have that open mind. Well, wine appreciation, how does that lead into today? I think it leads into today by our, as a community, now having the current times, these very so-called interesting times, finally coming to our town. So there will be a protest occurring down the street we hope it doesn't make it all the way down Main Street for the safety of our windows, but if it does, I hope everything's peaceful. But I would say this is the time to, regardless of our opinions, have some open-mindedness and some respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. We even got the Motown playing today. But the point is, let's take this, these times and think and uh, be kind to others and just have a bit of um, people appreciation, I would say, right? We have a nice thing going on here in Pleasanton. Even though a lot of us are red, others of us are blue. I'm wearing green today just to be diplomatic. We can agree. We can have really civil and wonderful disagreements along with a glass of wine. That's our community. We're lucky. We're upper middle class at the very least. You know, there's other situations out there, other communities that don't have that benefit where things are a little more jarring and confrontational because of the, the situation, the cultural situations, the income level and so on. So here it comes to Pleasanton. Uh, let's all respect R-E-S-P-E-C-T, which is, you know, another form of that crazy little thing called L-O-V-E. Love your neighbor. All right, onward. Let's get a little more lighthearted and talk about some new products that we've got. Right in front of me, you've got something uh, a, a, a extremely lighthearted and not the kind of thing that the wine steward always promotes. However, there is in fact wine in these cans along with bubbles and some gorgeous flavoring. So what these are are spritzers or spritzes and they come in four flavors. You wouldn't think I would normally go home with samples of anything but wine to check out. The vendors often say, hey Jim, take this home and mull it over. Do some appreciating at home. I took these home, lined them all up, put them on ice, I love them all. There's one that I don't love as much as the rest, I won't tell you because it could end up being your favorite. At any rate, these spritzes, which come from the Northwest, they're kind of small production. They're our kind of thing, wine shoppy thing. You're not gonna see them everywhere out there. They come in four packs. If we absolutely have to, we can mix up a four pack for you. And uh, they're not inexpensive, but with your wine club discount, get down to $22.49, I think, for four of these cans. You can treat them as cocktails. And so treating them that way, 
Actually, they represent very nice value out there on your patio. So for our next heat wave, consider these spritzes, all right? There's not a video that we're doing right now that doesn't include a rosé, and the new rosés are coming in by the week. We've never carried a rosé such as this. This is made with a grape called Pinot Denis. Pinot Denis is exclusive, nearly exclusive to the Rhone Valley of France. It's not known anywhere else. Maybe we have a little bit here in California, but for, for um, all intents and purposes, it is a Loire Valley grape that's pretty darn unique. It is also called Chenin Noir, uh, not Chenin Blanc. I don't know if it's e even related to Chenin Blanc, but all I can tell you is upon tasting this a couple days ago, we had to bring it in immediately. I'm glad it has a screw cap, because that means I can try it right with you. As you can see, the color is super delicate. This is our first, uh, first rosé of the year from the Loire Valley. As you know, we emphasize Provence and Spain and other places, but the Loire Valley does make fantastic rosé. This at room temperature has some fruit. I'm getting some strawberry, but what's prevailing is a, a very attractive earthiness. So it's not like tutti frutti. Instead, it has some savory earth, maybe some salinity. It's very juicy. It's not big in the mouth, but the sense of juiciness is like, that's what's the main remark of this wine. Very good acidity. It's got a nice snap to it. Tangy. I want some of the tuna that we sell along with it. Salat Nichois time again. Pinot Dany from Famille Bourgeois. And that's a, uh, a family of winemakers in the Loire Valley. They do everything from Sancerre to uh, some of the esoteric like this. So they're Loire Valley specialists making Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, and the like. And uh, now this finally has arrived. So check out the new rosé. Speaking of rosé, just as, a, as an aside, we have yet another sampler of rosés. This week it's, you're going to see it on our website as of today, it's rosé sampler number three. We keep rolling into new ones, new ones keep arriving. So we keep refreshing the rosé sampler idea for you because we know you're hooked, it's the right time of the year, and yet we know you as wine lovers want to keep it mixed up. So we're doing that for you. Why don't we mention a food item real quick for you? Check out this cheese. Is this the most beautiful piece of cheese you've ever seen? Look at the color. It's almost persimmon-like. Kathy says it reminds her of cantaloupe, but I would say if I had to refer to a melon, I would remember my dad's favorite melon. What he used to talk about all the time and what we could rarely find in the markets was a Persian melon, which is kind of a glorified cantaloupe, but at a deeper, darker, richer uh, flesh and flavor. So regardless, this is called Mimolette and it comes from France. It's a hard cheese. It's kind of like our aged Gouda. Um, you want to have little chunks of it because you don't need big ones. It's very intensely flavored, delicious with wines, especially reds, but it would go great with anything. So let's say it was in fact a piece of melon instead. What goes great with melon at this hot time of the year when you might be having that? How about this? Maybe we've shown it to you before, but I want to reiterate that this speck, speck is smoked ham from Italy. Thinly sliced speck is amazing at this time of the year because of its uh, ability to roll right around a piece of melon, for instance. That would be a great way to eat it. Serve it with slightly chilled reds, actually. Light reds, slightly chilled. I know, it's kind of weird to refrigerate reds, but in Europe they do it a lot more often than we do at this time of the year. It's not unusual, for instance, in Spain to order a, a, a glass of tinto and for it to come straight out of the refrigerator to your, to your uh, table, but it sure makes a lot of sense on a hot day or evening in Madrid. So try this spec, try this fantastic cheese, and before we get into the heart of the video, let me tell you about one more wine that we've just re-fallen in love with because it's not the first time that we've carried this and not the last, but what has just arrived is a gorgeous, perfect, I would call perfect Barbera for its price from Northern Italy, from the Piemonte region. So this is made by the great producer Vietti, who's probably more famous for their more expensive Barolos. And uh, yet they have to, of course, drink less expensive things on the weekdays, and so do we. So Vietti makes a gorgeous Barbera. 
Barbera is a sometimes misunderstood varietal because we who have only had California versions might expect something a little more rich and alcoholic and perhaps more amplified by oak. Uh, there's one extreme example of it out there. I won't mention it, but I think it's an abomination, frankly, to the idea of Barbera. And not to be negative, let's just get positive and say this is the idea, especially for people who want to get to know Italian wine and yet still aren't used to the fact that Barbera is a very high acid grape that when you have red wine and acidity doesn't necessarily make sense to all consumers, especially domestic, you know, American consumers. We want a little more padding in our mouth generally. We want to be able to drink a wine by itself. We appreciate the idea. Maybe we're getting into the idea of wine and food. This is for that. But because this particular Barbera did see a, uh, I think a year and a half in oak barrels, it's got a little of ox oxidation, a little rounding, a little bit of softening. It feels better in the mouth. It still has Barbera's telltale acidity, but uh, it has a little more comfort. Know, however, that those barrels are oversized and they are neutral. In other words, they've been used so many times that they're not giving any oak flavor to the wine. So you still get nothing but Barbera fruit here. It's just relaxed a little bit by the barrel time. But what is Barbera's main feature? I think the most gorgeous thing about Barbera isn't necessarily that high acidity or even the flavor, or even in this case, the comfort that you're gonna feel in the mouth. Barbera is nose. You should smell your wine. Back to respect, back to wine respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, wine appreciation. Maybe what I ought to be doing on a less significant day in Pleasanton is marching up and down the street with this sign. Smell thy wine. Have, have you any idea how many people come at a glass of wine and forget to smell it before tasting? I mean, that's the anticipation. That's the foreplay. That's the great thing about wine. You can smell wine all day and not get shit-faced, but it also sets you up. It makes you anticipate. It might even make your mouth water. It may have you thinking, hmm, what should I go to the refrigerator or the stove for to have along with this? Barbera, fantastic food wine. That smells good. Please smell this Barbera. Do it the honor. Finally, finally, we want to briefly point out that in these days that are interesting, as we keep calling them, um, we are uh, selling a lot of samplers and we've been focusing recently on our rosé samplers, even though we've done others. We have yet another sampler to coincide with that rosé sampler that's all white. That is all one grape variety. It focuses entirely on a great grape called Vermentino. We've been preaching the Vermentino word like crazy this year. I have just decided, well, I didn't just decide, I have had a sense for the last several years that Vermentino, not just because we can all pronounce it when we see it on a label, but because it's affable, uh, it, everybody else understands these flavors where you get tanginess and plushness at the same time. I think because of all of these features, it is the next great, great Italian white grape for people who want to know more beyond Pinot Grigio. So Vermentino, we can pronounce, and the cool thing about it is it has different, slightly different messages depending on where it's grown and who's making it. So why not put six of them together for you? You get to do your own investigation, your own inquiry into one great Italian, well, sometimes Italian grape. So Vermentino, it is uh, often grown on the island of Sardinia. So we have two from Sardinia to show you. And this sampler, this one from Santari. And well, I think I'm gonna tell you about the other Sardinia at the very end. But this one is reflects the fact that you are very near the ocean shore or the seashore with these vineyards. And the idea going on here is not necessarily comfort or richness or a yum factor. This is bracing and briny, tangy and enlivening. Fantastic with food. It is, it just, it, it jumps in the mouth. It's very happy, excited white wine. So put that off to the side. That's wine number one. Let's jump over to Tuscany. So 200 miles across the water to the Italian mainland. Tuscany is the other great and well-known source of Italian Vermentino. This is made by a super Tuscan producer. We've talked about it before. It's beautiful. It is a little more uh, broad and soft and rich than, let's say, this tangy one from Sardinia. They're both delicious. They both have beautiful fruit, but this one is just a little bit rounder, a little, you could say, sexier. Guadalajara, made by a super Tuscan producer. 
Now, we're gonna stay in Tuscany and note that from producer to producer, we're in the same region, a grape can still just come out of the, the glass or come out of the bottle into the glass and to the nose and behave slightly differently. So this one from yet another super Tuscan producer, Cristoforo, is a vermentino that's a little, little more earthy, a little more savory. It's still got the fruit, but this is more of a food wine perhaps, where these two could easily be fun cocktail wines. You know, they could be your, your careless hang, hang out, hang out on the patio wines. Here, I really want you to have some food. What would the food be? Grilled fish, uh, pork, cold chicken on top of a salad, all that, you're getting the idea. Perhaps the speck we were just talking about. All right, so that's wine number three in our sampler. Let's start talking about synonyms. As you may know, a grape is not always called by the same name depending on where you are. So Vermentino changes names when it goes up to Piemonte. Some people would argue with whether Favorita is exactly the same as, as the grape Vermentino. It's mutated perhaps enough by hanging out in Piemonte long enough to be a little bit different in its features. So some people will say, yeah, it's Vermentino, it's a form of Vermentino, or it's a mutation of Vermentino. It's kind of like the better known discussion about Primitivo and Zinfandel. If you know that Primitivo has spent at least 100 years in Puglia, Italy, all by its lonesome, and has kind of become its own thing, and yet it's still genetically identical to Zinfandel. Well, same thing here. But Favorita is what we call this grape in Piemonte. I've only had maybe two in my entire career. This one was just shown to us this week and it, it rang the bell. It's like, holy cow, we got wine number six for an all Vermentino sampler and we get to talk about a different grape name. So this is cool because it saw four, I think four hours on the skins before it fermented. So what you get from that, from the skin contact, that, that's something you might do with red wine, but not always with white. You get a little bit of tannin. We don't talk about tannins on white wines very often, but this wine will have a little more structure, a tannic structure to it, which once again calls for the food. So less of a cocktail white, you could easily, I could drink it all by itself, but I would far prefer to pair it with something that has a little bit of oil in it to resolve the, the, the little bit of tannin quality going on. But how cool to have Favorita. I think only 20 cases of this came to the West Coast. You're getting the taste of rarity. You're getting the taste novelty, but it's much more than a gimmick. It's really good wine that you ought to know about. Favorita from Piemonte, Italy. Another synonym for you. Um, while on the French island of Corsica, Vermentino retains its name, when you grow that grape in Provence, it changes names to Roll, R-O-L-L-E. Roll is more often seen as a tiny ingredient in Provence Rosé. It wouldn't be unusual to turn over a bottle of this color to look for the ingredients, and if the importer was kind enough to write what the wine is made of, you might see something like 50% Senso, 20% Grenache, uh, maybe a little Mauvet, or maybe, uh, who knows, some Syrah, and then perhaps 5% this grape, Roll. So what's pretty fun here is that Roll has been isolated in this bottle. This is a wine that we in fact gave to our white wine club back in February. We just got in three more cases. By the way, consider the investment we're making. We're buying two or three or four cases of each of these wines to be able to do this sampler for you. So I'm in money trouble again. So keep me, uh, keep me uh, safe from accounting please and, and help us with uh, a little bit of support here. But more interestingly to you and to me as the wine lover, Roll, 100%. It was given to the wine club. I know Joanne in particular will be very interested in coming in and getting more. She thought we were entirely sold out. She bought the last bottle. Hi, Joanne. Uh, pretty cool to taste. And if you imagine, close your eyes and try this wine, you might think you are in fact having Provence Rosé. It kind of behaves that way. Tangy and yet lush. And uh, it just says Provence somehow. A lot of you have gotten used to that sense. Finally, 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 a wine that we talked about last week where I don't really have to elaborate. If you watched last week's video, you know that we were, we were saying wonderful things about this wonderful wine, Argiolas. Argiolas takes us back to Sardinia, the island that's 200 miles off of the Tuscan coast for what I would say is kind of the cream of the crop, perhaps the most regal and most gorgeous wine here because it has all the flavor attributes we were discussing all along of melon, of citrus, uh, flowers, 
and yet what this adds is a very sexy and comforting textural effect. This wine feels good in the mouth. I think so many of us talk about what a wine smells like, many of us talk about flavors, but we cannot uh, take texture out of, the, uh, out of the conversation. Let's always wonder what a wine also feels like. Is it snappy? Is it nervy? This is a little less nervy. It's very relaxed and comfortable in the mouth. It didn't get any oak. It didn't get any, uh, you know, uh, amplification by wood at all. But uh, the, because of the vines being older and it being a, a better plot of uh, vineyard here, over here in Sardinia, the wine just naturally has a little more richness to it. Bone dry, wonderful wine, all of these are. We hope you'll consider the Vermentino sampler. I gotta pee, so that's the end of this video. We're very grateful for your support. Respect everybody, respect these wines, but respect one another as well. Thank you and have a great weekend.